Earth's water came from space, but not in the way we thought. Earth has vast oceans today, but our planet was a dry rock when it first formed, and water was a late addition, rained down in asteroids from the icy outer solar system. That's what the textbooks say, but new research published today in the journal Science adds weight to a competing idea that Earth was actually born wet. Water is abundant in space and is made up of hydrogen created in the Big Bang and oxygen released by dying stars. So I want to take a closer look at the Big Bang theory that we've heard so much about because it's interesting when science comes to the discovery of something that was already known if it was a trusted source and so many people do trust this science and then there are many people who trust the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Meaning, in the beginning, from day one, God created everything from the heavens to the earth. And this first verse is a one-line summary of the first chapter. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. At this point, there is no earth yet. Just a vast void of darkness and the waters, probably in gaseous form like a fog. And then there is God's energy, his spirit moving across the face of the waters like a wind. And then there was sound, God's voice. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Bang. And this is where I want to take a closer look at this theory. George Lemaitre, father of the Big Bang. According to the Big Bang theory, the expansion of the observable universe began with the explosion of a single particle at a definite point in time. This startling idea first appeared in scientific form in 1931 in a paper by George Lemaitre a Belgian cosmologist and Catholic priest. See, I told you guys. The theory accepted by nearly all astronomers today was a radical departure from scientific orthodoxy in the 1930s. Many astronomers at the time were still uncomfortable with the idea that the universe is expanding, that the entire observable universe of galaxies began with a bang seemed preposterous. The Mata explored the logical consequences of an expanding universe and boldly proposed that it must have originated at a finite point in time. If the universe is expanding, he reasoned, it was smaller in the past. An extrapolation back in time which should lead to an epoch when all the matter in the universe was packed together in an extremely dense state. Appealing to the new quantum theory of matter, Lamata argued that the physical universe was initially a single particle that the primeval atom, as he called it, which disintegrated in an explosion, giving rise to space and time and the expansion of the universe that continues to this day. This idea marked the birth of what we know as Big Bang cosmology. I have no problem with the mathematics about this theory in a perfect world, but it's not, and it's one of the reasons it remains a theory, because it can't be proven. Scientists think because they can split open particles using other particles that this is similar to the Big Bang. The Mata is talking about a single particle densely packed with the universe inside that just popped open because only God knows why. And if there was a Big Bang that just happened by accident, 
when is it going to happen again? When is the next big bang likely to occur? Will it be a bigger bang or a smaller bang? Oh, so you mean to tell me that the big bang happened only one time forever? Is that how science works, guys? And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So at this point, and my question is, where is the light coming from? Because there is no mention of stars until later. So what is giving off this light? You see, if you were sitting and talking with Moses, and he were to tell you this story as it is written, I'm sure you'd say something like, hold up, dude, you're not making any sense. And you're leaving out some important details, buddy. I already see you have a problem with telling the story out of order. And if you are telling the story in order of events, why didn't you say he created the stars first and then there was light? So first there was light and then there were stars. I kid it. Stupid me. Or is Moses talking about matter? Is he actually describing the separation of matter and dark matter? And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And so here we go again, right here. What in the universe is Moses talking about? Why do we have to decode every single word this guy says? He's got people thinking the earth is flat. But there ain't no earth yet, according to this series of events. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. As far as I can tell at this point, God is organizing all the matter. So that it is all moving along a flat plane. Do you see? So you have empty space above this plane. And you have empty space below this plane. Because if you were able to step back and look at the universe as a whole, you would see that it looks like a flat plane. Do you guys understand? I didn't make that up myself. NASA scientists say that. What shape is the universe? As far as cosmologists can tell, space is almost perfectly flat. But what does this mean? Say you're standing in one corner of a square room. Walk 10 feet along the wall to the next corner. Then turn 90 degrees. Walk another 10 feet and turn 90 degrees again. Do this twice more and you'll find yourself back where you started. You've completed a square. This is the standard Euclidean geometry that we all learned in high school. And if you add one more dimension, you get a flat universe. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he sees. And he saw that it was good. So here we have the waters and matter coming together to form the earth. Just the land and water. Then, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So here's where things get really tricky for science, and that is the origin of life. So far up to this point, science has in a way confirmed what was written. But they can't figure out how you get life from inorganic material. Now in a lab, yeah, you can create something like amino acids. But listen, Darwin wrote the book the origin of the species and doesn't even explain the origin of life 
there is the primordial soup or sludge theory. There is spontaneous generation, which is more in line with evolutionary biology. But look, even if life just suddenly sprung into action, that first life form has to come intact with a working intelligence to grow. And a working intelligence because it has to eat something or absorb and use some type of energy. Not only that, it has to come with programming to make copies of itself. Everything alive does this, okay? Organic compounds is not a living organism. If those organic compounds aren't doing those things, it's not alive. It's just sludge. And electricity isn't going to jolt it into life. These scientists are actually thinking like Dr. Frankenstein, some of them. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven and to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Come on, Moses. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention he made the stars too. You see? So now we have the lights in the firmament. The sun, the moon, the stars, right? So again, what light was he talking about before? Now to me, in my opinion, the firmament sounds like the alignment or organization of heavenly bodies. We kind of see the stars in a pretty firm position against other stars. They are not just flying around all over the place, you see? They are in a firm movement. Firmament. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. See, that was all on the fourth day when he already said that he created light on the first day. Anyway, now this is the part where evolution comes in. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. See, if evolution has any role to play in this, it was on the fifth and sixth day. But in the biblical text, it says that life was spoken into existence. So again, we have sound vibration creating the matrix for life. Look into cymatics and how sound vibration organizes matter to learn more about that. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. See right there? That sounds more like evolution, but of course under the control of a supreme intelligence. Also, it sounds like the parent creatures are not coming from one single organism, but several different organisms at different times that then gave birth to life on the planet. And once again, Moses leaves us hanging. Who is us? Oh, right. He just forgot to mention the creation of angels. It just slipped his mind. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. You know what's funny, folks? In the next chapter, God was pleased with everything that he created, and rested on the seventh day. Then, creates man again. (laughs) Of course I'm being funny, but Moses should have probably mentioned how man was formed in the first chapter. When he wrote this, did he read this back to himself? I, I know I'm picking on Moses. I'm just having some fun, folks. The point is, we have this ancient narrative and others from around the world And then we have modern science. And I think modern scientists, the few who are awakened, maybe have already come to the understanding of why we keep records of the past. That's all for now. There is more to come. Be sure to visit woodwardentertainment.com and the Woodward Entertainment Store. You can follow me on Instagram at J-A-E Woodward. Thank you for joining me for this brief discussion about some of the things that come to my mind. Everyone have a great day, and as always, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.